Welcome, and let's first talk compliance. I'm Catherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager at First Healthcare Compliance. Thanks for tuning in. You can follow First Healthcare Compliance on Twitter at FirstHCC or on Facebook and Instagram at First Healthcare Compliance or hashtag First Talk Compliance. On today's episode, we are speaking with Stan Spittek, President of Fire and Life Safety, Inc., about fire and life safety compliance, trends and topics in healthcare facilities. New requirements, trends, and best practices will be reviewed to help providers understand the critical importance of safe and compliant environment of care. We will review specific code requirements, NFPA 101 and 99, that apply to regulated healthcare facilities by CMS and other authorities having jurisdiction, highlight new code requirements that are now being enforced by CMS, including annual fire door assembly inspection, and the NFPA 99 risk assessment process, and motivate and educate listeners to understand the critical importance of life safety compliance in regulated healthcare facilities and strategies for survey success. Mr. Spittek is a nationally known fire and life safety disaster preparedness consultant with more than 30 years of experience as an emergency responder, public official, local code enforcement officer, and private consultant serving clients in all occupancy types, but with a special focus on multi-unit residential housing properties, healthcare, and educational institutions. So Stan, can you tell me how codes have changed over time to help ensure a safer environment of care? Yeah, for sure. Fire sprinkler systems have become much more advanced and reliable. The big pushback from sprinkler systems uh, in the old days, when they were more basic, was like, you know, okay, we're going to have the water actually do more damage than the fire. Well, with the optimization of fire sprinkler system technology and fire alarm system integration with the fire sprinkler system, they become much more reliable. And the codes have accounted for this as well. The codes know that a safe environment of care is premised on the presence of those life-saving systems, fire alarm systems, smoke detectors, pull stations, duct detectors, elevator recall. All the things that make that environment of care safer are based on those systems along with the fire sprinkler system. You know, the fire sprinkler system is a system that responds in the capacity that I previously mentioned. When heat is present, those sprinkler heads will activate at a specific temperature and discharge water from that individual sprinkler head affected by that heat. It is not until heat is present at another sprinkler head before those other sprinkler heads will actually activate. But in advance of sprinkler activation, you've got smoke detectors, you've got heat detectors, you've got employees that may discover a fire and know that they need to go to the nearest pull station and activate the alarm. Because of all these advances in fire protection systems, um, the codes acknowledge that we can build our healthcare facilities bigger with longer travel distances to an exit. Prior to all healthcare facilities in general, and specifically I'm talking about hospitals and nursing homes, Prior to them being required to be fully sprinklered, there were options in the code that said if your building was sprinklered, you had X amount of travel distance to an exit, and if your building was unsprinklered, you'd have less of a travel distance. Well, now because all healthcare facilities are generally sprinklered, we've got you know a, a bigger and a better environment of care that is fully protected. The codes also allow for some relaxation of the building requirements of these buildings. Because the sprinkler system is a proactive suppression device that will put the fire out, typically, according to the National Fire Protection Association, almost 96% of the time, right at its point of origin, we are able to relax the building materials in most states and jurisdictions to a lesser quality so that um, you know you can construct these kinds of healthcare facilities in a more affordable manner. Now um, they're they're definitely not unsafe when they're built with a lesser uh, construction standard. They're just as safe because those fire protection features are there 
and they allow the occupancy to, to, to occur within those spaces. Other things uh, include the integration of uh, protective devices, otherwise known as doors. Doors in healthcare facilities require certain fire resistance or smoke resistant uh, ratings or capabilities. And you'll see in a healthcare facility uh, labels on doors. Those doors clearly state the rating of that door and uh, what their capacity or capability is to resist smoke or actually to resist sm uh, fire. Now, with these new uh, changes come some new requirements, particularly when it comes to the smoke and fire doors within your building. Uh, NFPA 80, the standard for fire doors, requires that an annual fire door assembly inspection or FDAI process is completed on the fire doors within your facility. So that means that your maintenance crew or a third party like a vendor needs to come in and do an annual documented inspection on all those labeled fire doors in your building to ensure that they're uh, appropriate for that opening. So everything from the hardware to the door itself, to the hinges, to the closing devices, to the positive latch, to the gaps around the door and the frame, they all have to be comprehensive, comprehensively evaluated by a qualified person on an annual basis, and you need to maintain documentation of such. Now, for those of you that are on the, on the, on the line today thinking to yourself, do I have to hire somebody to do that? Well, Medicare has come out with an interpretation that says your maintenance crew, in the course of their routine maintenance of your facility, is qualified to conduct these types of inspections. Now, I certainly have, have some clients that um, hire someone to do this, but that can be pretty costly. And as long as you've got a resource, a checklist, something that you can follow that's in compliance with the prescription of NFPA, these FDAI requirements, you'll be able to make sure that you're compliant. But more importantly, you want to make sure that that door fits solidly in the frame. You want to make sure that that door, if it is required to latch, which most doors in healthcare facilities are required to latch, you want to make sure that it does latch. Because in a fire, the, dis the, uh, the difference between life and death sometimes can be a closed door. So I understand that you're doing quite a bit of mock life safety and emergency preparedness surveys for your clients, but can you tell us some of the things that you are seeing out in the field? Yep. You know, I was just on a, uh, a mock survey at one of my clients' facilities the other day in northern Arizona, and I got to tell you, you know, the commonalities of the issues that uh, I see just never ceases to amaze me. And it's not rocket science. It's not earth-shattering uh, deficiencies that I'm seeing. But I'm seeing the same things, just like any surveyor, mock surveyor, or a person who's doing a self-assessment in their own building is going to find if they open their eyes and look. Some of the common things that we continue to see in keeping with the theme of fire protection is when I walked into the building, went to the riser room to access the, the spare sprinkler box and to look at the riser and the valves and the gauges themselves, the area around these critical components of the building's life safety system, i.e. the sprinkler system, was completely obstructed by storage. There were carts, there were boxes, there were items that really inhibited access to those valves. Now think of it this way. What if that deep freeze occurs? And what if there's not a fire in the building, but you've had a, a freeze of your sprinkler system and your administrator yells to the maintenance director, shut it down, we've got a broken pipe, which actually happened in one of my facilities. As a matter of fact, the one that I'm talking about the other day, they had to run down to that sprinkler riser room. They had to push boxes and other items out of the way just to get to the valve to, show it off, to, uh, to shut it off during that incident. But more importantly, you don't want to obstruct access for the fire department or someone else that needs to inspect and have access. So I see a lot of obstructed components of fire safety systems, whether it's the fire alarm panel in a storage room that has boxes or other items stored in front of it, 
or the sprinkler valves in the sprinkler control room that are obstructed. You've got to keep clearance around these um, types of items. Similarly, I will see the same types of obstructions around electrical boxes and electrical panels. And if you're that healthcare provider that's looking for that deficiency-free survey and you've got boxes or storage items in front of your circuit breaker boxes, electrical panels, and things of that nature, you're going to get a tag. You're going to get that deficiency. The magic number seems to be um, 36 inches. You've got to maintain 36 inches around your fire extinguisher cabinets. I don't want to see a wheelchair in front of that cabinet or bed or a cart. You've got to maintain 36 inches around your fire alarm pull stations. But there's another number that you need to remember as well, and that number is 18 inches. When it comes to storage height in a storage room, a closet, a linen closet, a soiled utility, clean utility, that sprinkler system is designed for you to maintain maximum storage height 18 inches below the bottom of the sprinkler head or the deflector. So a lot of times I'll go into storage rooms in healthcare facilities and to help maintain that maximum storage height, the facility will go ahead and they'll put a red stripe, a blue stripe, a black stripe. It doesn't matter what color, but they'll put a stripe in the room that demarks or identifies that 18 inch maximum storage height. Well, it is common that I walk into these types of rooms and I see storage above that storage line all the time. And from the surveyor's perspective, or my perspective as the mock surveyor, it's like you're actually more complicit as far as I'm concerned. You've gone ahead and marked the room, you've identified your maximum storage height, and you've got staff that are still storing higher than they should. When you store higher and in that clearance zone, the possibility of that sprinkler system being incapable of extinguishing a fire exists. Or, more commonly, you uh, kind of develop uh, blockage or obstructions because you're storing too high and that sprinkler head is designed to spray outward. So you've got to maintain 18 inches of clearance. Another common situation that I, I see, especially in the months when the seasons are changing, it gets really cold or it gets really uh, warm, is doors have a tendency of failing to, co uh, to positively latch. Mm. Like I said earlier, the critical capability of a door is that it positively latches to resist smoke and to resist fire. If that door does not positively latch, the pressure of combustion and smoke can either push that door open or have a negative effect on it. But when the seasons change, when the temperatures rise or drop, when humidity is in the air or it gets extremely arid, uh, those doors have a tendency to warp. So whenever I do a mock survey, I will check every door in your building and look for a positive latch. That should definitely be a PM, a preventative maintenance item on your PM list to ensure that every door in a facility is able to close completely and latch. What other things do you see or what other types of things would you would you like to tell us about? Yeah, some other things that I commonly see uh, include the means of egress being obstructed. And what I mean by that is the hallway. The hallway and the stairwells are the most important passive elements of fire protection and fire safety built in any building. Because when you think about it, you need to use the hallway to get out. You need to use those stairs to exit the building. And when they're obstructed, uh, it's a problem. Let's talk about the stairs real quick. Stairways are kind of a conduit, uh, a passageway that needs to be a safe haven for everybody who's above the grade level of exit discharge or the street level um, to get out of the building. You know, in many healthcare facilities, and ironically enough, in newer healthcare facilities, one of the things that they fail to design into these buildings is storage space. So a lot of times I'll be doing a mock survey and I'll get to the basement landing or the first floor landing stairwell uh, in a building and there'll be all types of storage items within that landing tucked underneath the stair. Well, that is the fire safety violation. If I was the fire marshal, 
I'd probably give you one chance to remove it. If not, you'd be getting a ticket. If it's seen by a surveyor, they're going to automatically give you a deficiency, issue a tag, because the stairwell and that passageway has got to be free and clear of all obstructions and all combustible material. So you can't store in the stairwell, yet I see it all the time. Let's go into your healthcare facility, into the hallway, something we take for granted. You utilize that hallway almost every moment you're at work within your facility. And what do I see? I see a lot of activity, and I see a lot of items in that hallway on both sides of the hallway that make that a non-compliant situation. Healthcare facilities are required, particularly our nursing homes, our hospitals, inpatient hospice, dialysis centers, surgical units, any component of a hospital, either as a regulatory requirement or as a best practice, should always keep items in the hallway on one side or the other. There are some very specific requirements in Chapter 18 and 19 of the Life Safety Code that tells you specifically how much available space is allowable minimally within a hallway. A minimal width of a hallway in a healthcare facility like a nursing home or a hospital is eight feet. Within that eight feet, you are allowed to store items on one side or the other, actually have them present, not necessarily in storage, but a medical cart, a food service cart, a housekeeping cart, a wheelchair, a lift. Those items, as long as they're in use, are allowed to be within the means of egress or the hallway, as long as they don't uh, obstruct that eight-foot corridor any more than three feet. So that means that you've got to have five feet of residual clear exit width around those types of items. And also when the fire alarm sounds or there's the potential for a a fire in the building, your staff have to be trained to clear those hallways. Get everything out of the hallway so that you've got a clear path of egress. But a common problem that I see is items on both sides of the hallway, things in the swing paths of your cross corridor, smoke and fire doors. You've got to understand that in that one moment in time, that you hope and pray never happens. That conduit, that area, that hallway that we take for granted needs to be free and clear of obstructions so that you can evacuate people in that moment of emergency. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to First Talk Compliance. And my guest today is Stan Spittek, president of Fire and Life Safety, Inc. Do you have anything else that you're seeing out in the field that we should be aware of? You know, staff training, we take it for granted You know, we just assume that if we plop in a video cassette or log into a training program that your company might have online, or you might have somebody come out periodically and do a fire safety in-service like I do for my clients, you've got to challenge your staff. When I do a mock survey, I will walk up to a CNA a dietary aide, a maintenance assistant, and sometimes even the administrator or executive director of a facility. And I'll put them on the spot and I'll say, what's your code for fire? And I'll ask them to explain to me the race procedure, which is common in most healthcare facilities. Race stands for rescue, alarm, contain, extinguish. Those are the four steps that all healthcare employees should really have ingrained in them so that they know exactly what to do. And then when I ask them, what do you, how do you use a fire extinguisher? Where is the closest fire extinguisher? The problem with survey or mock survey is that when you put someone on the spot and they're either not prepared or they just don't know how to respond to something that they weren't expecting, you know, many times the surveyor and me as the mock surveyor get that deer in the headlight stare. We get that person who almost forgets their own name. They get so nervous and they can't answer the question. Now, if that is a surveyor from the state or an accrediting agency that is interviewing an employee and asking some basic questions about fire response, evacuation, sheltering in place, if they can't communicate their knowledge adequately, and even if they've got the knowledge, but at that one moment they kind of forget everything, you're looking at a deficiency. You're looking at a problem. So it's really about 
incorporating a culture of safety and preparedness within your healthcare facility. Regular training regimens with the new emergency preparedness rules of participation state that your employees demonstrate their knowledge of your facility's emergency operation plan. They need to know where the food, the water, where the emergency supplies are located. They need to know race and pass like they know the back of their hand. And you've got to prepare those employees for the survey process. But more importantly, not just compliance for compliance sake, you need them to remember these things in the midst of an emergency. And if they can't effectively communicate that in a, in a survey process, you've got a question, will they be able to perform in the midst of an emergency? That's exactly what I was thinking. I would say the bigger problem is not that they're a deer in headlight then, that the bigger problem is that what's going to happen if there's an emergency, right? The bigger problem is they have to respond immediately and know, just immediately go into response mode, right? Yeah. I mean, without training, you know, you are potentially in a triple F situation, a fight, flight, or freeze. Well, in, in the context of emergency response in a healthcare facility, we don't want people to freeze like they do when I ask some basic questions during a mock survey. We don't want them to flee because we know that they've got responsibility for right. those people uh, under their care. We want them to fight, and the context of fight means we want them to respond. We want right. them to race. We want them to rescue anyone in immediate jeopardy. We want them to activate the alarm. To, to make sure that emergency forces are notified and others are aware of the emergency. We want them to see, contain. They need to close doors. They need to limit the spread of a fire. And in the case of the fire in a specific room of origin, they need to close the door to that room so that the fire doesn't spread. And then finally, they have to e either evacuate or extinguish the fire. So that's what RACE stands for. You know, there was a tragic fire in, a, in an apartment building in New York City a couple of um, holiday seasons ago, where in the commission of a fire in an apartment unit, the family was fleeing the unit that was on fire. But when they left the unit, the apartment unit, and they got into the hallway, the means of egress, they failed to close the door to the room that was on fire. Oh, gosh. And that fire in an unsprinklered apark- apartment building, well, as you can imagine, the smoke found its way through all the corridors. The stairwell doors were actually propped open for convenience. And as that fire and smoke sp- spread throughout that building, I think it was about a dozen of people so- or so that were killed in that fire. So rescue, alarm, confine or contain by closing doors, and then either extinguish or evacuate. Most of the healthcare facilities that I work with use race in the context of rescue, alarm, contain, extinguish. Other providers will say evacuate for the E component, but whatever you do, you've got to know the procedure and you've got to be able to communicate it. Well, do you have final thoughts for us? You know, the prevailing attitude of most of us is it's something that's going to happen to somebody else, whether it's a shooting in a school a fire in a retirement community, community uh, you know, a fire in a hospital, a gas leak in the kitchen of a healthcare facility. We just don't really think it's going to happen to us. In my time on the fire department, when I would get ready for my 24-hour shift or when the alarm was coming in, my beeper would be activated or I'd be in the, sta- in the station when the station tones would go off and the lights would go on, my attitude was guilty until proven innocent, meaning you've got to default to there's a fire when an alarm activates. There's a fire when somebody says code red in your building. Don't default to that line of thinking like, oh, must be a false alarm. Ah, Maybe they're testing the system. You've got to err on the side of patient safety and facility safety. That doesn't mean you live in a paranoid state. That doesn't mean that you panic and every time the alarm goes off, the building is on fire. But your mindset is it can happen to us and it can happen here. That's why training, drills, and exercises have to be taken seriously. You know, in healthcare facilities, when it comes to fire drills, 
hospitals, nursing homes, anybody regulated by chapters 18 and 19 of NFPA 101, the Life Safety Code, as adopted by CMS, you've got to do one fire drill per shift per quarter. Now, I know that there's a lot of people that have worked in healthcare facilities a long, long time. And the attitude that we sometimes encounter is like, really? I've been doing this for 30 years. I know how to shut the doors. I know race. I know path. But it's muscle memory. It's creating that culture of preparedness. And that requires commitment by all stakeholders. And when you're doing a drill, you're doing a training exercise, you've got to consider that the net benefit of that's going to be that one brief moment in time where something potentially catastrophic is happening and you're able to mitigate that situation. You know, some of the things that we're not hearing about, unless you're really looking hard, uh, are some of the victories that occurred in some of the catastrophic wildfires recently in California. You know, one of the most horrific being the fire in Paradise, California, where it wasn't paradise at all. It was paradise lost and everything was scoured. It was scorched off the face of the earth, including healthcare facilities. Two nursing homes that I know of were completely burned to the ground. And I actually work with the California Association of Health Facilities, and we train our nursing home providers in California to be ready for anything, including wildfires. And when the first alert came that there was a fire coming near the facility, that facility's training, education, and experience kicked in. You didn't hear about the nursing homes that burned in paradise or the fire at the hospital because they followed their plan. They utilized their training experiences and everything collectively. And even though the buildings are gone, everyone survived. So it's really about culture. It's really about taking everything seriously, especially the, especially those fire drills. Thank you so much for being with us, Dan. I really appreciate it. I know our listeners will appreciate it. And so I really thank you for being here on First Talk Compliance. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to our audience for tuning in to First Talk Compliance. You can learn more about the show on the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And lend your voice to the conversation on Twitter at FirstHCC or hashtag FirstTalkCompliance. You can also email me at Catherine Short at firsthcc.com. I'm Catherine Short of First Healthcare Compliance. Remember, compliance is the key to achieving peace of mind.